and our speaker, of course, has another event to get to this afternoon as a part of his um, ongoing visit here in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, but uh, very quickly, to summarize what we're going to do, uh, Dr. Schumacher, uh, whose bi biography I've already shared with you by email and uh, is um, extensive, uh, but as you know, he is a, a scholar of uh, international religious liberty, so I have uh, asked him to address uh, two topics for us in the time that we have. Uh, first of all, issues relating to international religious liberty, and uh, IRD's religious liberty director, Faith McDonald, will have a question or two for him to contribute to that conversation. Uh, and then also I'm asking Dr. Schirmacher uh, to address the topic of uh, Christian democracy, in that most Americans don't really understand what that is. It sounds a little bit uh, curious uh, to us. Uh, my own curiosity was stimulated uh, recently when a, a fairly well-known uh, evangelical American thinker in his um, exasperation over uh, Christian involvement in American politics suggested perhaps we need our own Christian democratic movement in the U.S., which struck me as very odd because uh, in our history we have never had uh, such a movement. But maybe Dr. Schumacher can offer some insights as to how Christian democracy has uh, worked uh, in continental Europe and uh, why it has never really been part of the history of the uh, Anglo-American uh, political tradition. Uh, and uh, Mark Levecki, who is the managing editor of our foreign policy journal Providence, will have a question or two for Dr. Schumacher on that issue. And maybe Dr. Schumacher can share with us uh, if we could cram in uh, a lot, uh, several different topics, uh, a few insights on uh, German politics um, right now, uh, ongoing this week. So, uh, Dr. Schumacher, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, if we could perhaps talk about Christian democracy first for about 10 minutes, and Mark will have a question for you, and we'll move on from there. Can I sit? Please have a seat. Yeah, I think that our two uh, topics are very much related, but this is new. Five years ago, um, the Christian Democratic parties in Europe were the ones that were uh, very much propagating freedom of religion and belief, not only for Christians, but for all, while all other groups and all other parties were not interested in this topic at all. Uh, those who have a more humanistic or atheistic leaning uh, take it for granted. They do not understand that in Europe they are allowed to live because we have freedom of religion and belief. Yeah, And I have to remind journalists often that uh, 100 years ago, by leaving the church, they just must have lost their job. Um, and that um, if they are against changing religion, that all those who left the church technically changed their religion and still have their jobs. Um, the um, the the uh, the whole situation changed, and I have to add, um, the Hans Seidel Stiftung is connected to the Christian Social Union in Bavaria, and the rest of the country, also um, North Rhine-Westphalia, where I come from, is the Christian Democratic Union. They have a kind of symbiose since 1949. It's a little strange because technically there are two parties, which do not overlap anywhere. Yeah, but in Parliament since '49 they are counted as one party, and and are normally the largest party. So normally the the president of the Parliament comes from this party, and if the Social Democratic Party would go to the Constitutional Court and tell them it's two parties, they have to be counted separately, they probably would win. Yeah, but nobody has done this since '49. Um, and um, the Christian Social Union always was a bit more conservative, more t more to the right. But you have to see they have been ruling Bavaria with more than 50% of the votes for most of the time. And of course, being alone, it was much easier for them to be conservative yeah, than in the rest of the country where you always needed a coalition partner. So, but it went well. Now we got um, at least a million refugees. I'm not going into the details. We could spend for hours what happened there. And um, no, nobody had any plan, no good plan, no bad plan. Most of the things that sh just happened. Nevertheless, uh, we suddenly had a million um, Muslims uh, coming from all parts of the world. And this changed the fabric of Christian Democratic Union parties in Europe. In the main, you could say in Europe that wherever 
the uh, right-wing parties were the conservative, like in Britain, they either disappeared or have lost all credibility, like in Britain, yeah, with in-house fights. Um, it is in the countries where the conservative parties, which always included humanist people, atheist people in Germany, um, we have, of course, Muslim members of the Christian Democratic Union, but which on purpose said the anchor, so to speak, is um, um, is the Christian view of man. Um, wherever you had this, and this was taken serious, the parties still exist or are still the largest party. That's the amazing thing. Mm -hmm. To be frank, um, other than in the US, for me being the, the reason being, I'm also a, so, a sociologist, the reason being that the Christian Democratic Union or Social Union or however they were called, had an anchor outside everyday politics. I think that's a big difference to the US, where the Christian idea is, is so mixed into party politics yeah, that it, it, it is not a factor that appeases people, that brings them together, while in Germany, um, other countries, it's, it's very largely seen as an, a moral factor outside, which is not part of everyday politics, yeah? but you can refer, refer to and, and help the thing to survive. Now, in Germany, it was very typical, the Christian Social Union, um, to make it very simple, was opposed to let so many people in. Nobody really knew where they come from, what the reason was. Uh, and we had the strange situation that the media, mainly the left-wing media, really worked in favor of it. So the Spiegel, our largest magazine, um, the day the first trains arrived in Munich, had a cover which says, dark and light Germany. Yeah? And the dark Germany, you could see, looked a little bit like national socialism. Yeah? And we had the light Germany, and this is the good Germany now. Germany has overcome its history, now we accept the refugees. The same Spiegel now every day is uh, writing against Mrs. Merkel because some weeks later they found out that the people don't like this and that they for the first time ever have a chance really to go against Mrs. Merkel. So now the left-wing media all are against further refugees. But the Christian Social Union from the very beginning thought, okay, this has happened, but this is this. And if we accept more, we need a limit. We need a near limit. Mrs. Merkel stood for the other position. So um, the, the, the two parties never have been so much uh, in opposition to each other. And this, of course, is very closely connected to the problem of religious freedom. Many of us are very happy about, among the refugees, are about 100,000 Christians from the Middle East. Yeah. So Poland, Hungary, many countries say, we take only in Christians. And when I visit the Polish government, I laugh. They have taken 3,000 Christians and nobody else. Yeah? We have taken 100,000 Christians. I'm the um, head ch uh, chair of the advisory board of the Central Council of Oriental Christians in Germany. And we probably have in the moment up to two and a half million Christians from the Middle East already in, in, in Germany. Yeah? So um, though this departed, but this happened in all over Europe. Um, in the European Parliament, it is the European People Party, which is the conservative, but mainly the Christian Democratic Party from, from Europe, being the largest uh, group in the European Parliament. And they were quite close to each other. It's difficult because they come from 16 different countries, but nevertheless, they work together now with the refugee crisis. Why is it connected to religious liberty? Because on the one side, it is the question, may we only get take in Christians or people that are like-minded and especially will integrate? I mean, the Christians coming from the Arab world, they speak Arab, they look like Arabs, they are Arabs. Nevertheless, two years later, it is difficult to find them in society. Yeah, they just get into society, get jobs, work, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and uh, so suddenly we had the situation that um, in, in, in the, if you take the European People Party, the branch in Hungary, which uh, where Orban rules, is very close to the Christian Social Union. Martin and I, Martin is my well, yeah, my personal assistant, as you can see. We we visited uh, Orban. Orban is very much investing a lot of money 
in getting Christian refugees back into areas where the war is over. Yeah? But of course his interest is that they do not come to Hungary, even the Christians, and they of course do not want anybody else. While in Germany we in moment have the fight over a new government, the coalition, and uh, so far we do not know whether we will get a limit. Yeah, the Christian Social Union, uh, Horst Seehofer is very much fighting for it. He probably speaks for the majority of Germans uh, in this matter. And the Social Democratic Union doesn't want any restriction. Yeah, they even would like uh, that all the relatives can come. That would be an additional five million people to the one million people if they can bring their wives and daughters and, and, and so on. Um, and Mrs. Merkel is somewhere in between trying to, to, to create a government out of this. So um, at the same time, um, we have the situation that we that are in favor of religious freedom have to find a way to tackle with so many Muslims in our country. And you have to say we have many Muslims that come to Germany because of religious freedom. We have the um, we have the um, from people from Turkey. All that do not have mainline Islam, the Sunni Islam, come to Germany so that their kids are not forced into religious education. Yeah, we probably have one million Turks, Turkish Muslims, that did come to Germany, and Bavaria has their own has 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 their own religious education in school for them, so they love to move to Bavaria. So that is the other side of saying we don't want more uh, Muslims. That many of the Muslims come for religious freedom, um, and we of course have the other fraction, what we call the Islamists, that come for the opposite reason. They have to leave their countries because they fight religious freedom and think Germany is a nice haven. Um, and uh, this is um, this is a very difficult thing. To, uh, but I think you really need to need this two-side approach, which becomes more and more the standard for the Christian Democratic parties in Germany, to say we need to do both at the same time: fight for the religious freedom, and um, fight Islamists in Germany under the um, Christian Democratic Union's um, Minister of Inner Affairs, uh, mosque is, is raided every day in the average. Mm -hmm. And they always find weapons, and no other European country does this. We are the only country doing this. But they find weapons, they find money, they find literature, etc., etc. So they try on the one side to put a lot of pressure on, on Islamists, and at the other side, um, my... Um, Mrs. Merkel is famous for her words, uh, Islam belongs to Germany. She probably, after ruling the country for 12, 12 years, did not e expect that this, for many, would be the only thing she ever said. Um, um, the party was a little upset. My wife, who's a professor of Islamic studies and very close to Mrs. Merkel, spoke with her. So on the next day in the parliament, she said, Islam belongs to Germany. But the Sharia does not belong to Germany. But the left-wing media never quoted this. It's nowhere recorded. It's in, in the parliament minutes. You, you can see this. Yeah. So um, this, this uh, are the two sides. The Christian Democratic parties um, have been caught. Um, but, I mean, they did not expect that this would be the major topic they would have to solve. And now we have the division all over Europe. And I personally see this as one of the biggest dangers um, the Christian Democratic Union's parties have managed um, to assure that there is a general Christian identity. Um, Mrs. Merkel explains it by saying polit uh, uh, politics works on the Christian view of man, human dignity, etc., etc. Yeah? This is what we, we have in common. Um, now, suddenly, th there is a different tone. One side saying we have to uh, protect the Christian identity of Europe, yeah, which is, is is a hot topic because the question is in how far Europe still is um, is uh, uh, Christian, and what they do not understand is normally if you say Christian you mean a specific uh, confession. So Poland, uh, the, the the party that did win the election and rules the country now. Of course, by Christian means Catholic. And I, as a Protestant, would have no place in, in this Poland. 
Yeah? And this is what, what they often do not understand. The Christian Democratic Union, the Christian Social Union are called Union because after the Second World War they said we have no place for a Catholic party, a Protestant party, this and this. Yeah? But Christians need to take their core values and work together. And this is in real danger in the moment that, uh, that the parties again become, I see this in, in, in Austria, where you have this young uh, chancellor now who, who partly did win his election by doing as if he would be the big counterpart to Mrs. Merkel. Um, and uh, nevertheless, when I read what he says, it's, he's speaking about the Catholic Austria. Yeah, he's not speaking about a Christian Austria. And that of, mean, of course means, and is a very dangerous thing, we are not talking mainly about values, which I fully would agree, but we are talking about influence of the church, the organization. And that's a totally different thing, of course. That really goes against uh, uh, religious freedom. Um, I spoke about um, the, the, the whole uh, meeting Orban, um, and it's very difficult on the one side I think every country, this is democracy. And if the Hungary people vote, we don't want more refugees. I mean, it's up to them. It's not up to the Germans to tell them, you, this is what you should vote. Same in Austria. Um, um, on the other side, the religious freedom situation in Hungary is becoming very difficult for Jews, for minorities. Yeah, because with this new push, it is no longer Christian values, which then would include religious freedom. I mean, I'm, we all probably are convinced that uh, religious freedom is part of the DNA of Christianity. It is not just a political principle, yeah, but there is no force in religion. Nobody should be forced to believe something. Um, but it, it, it uh, become, gets this tension that the church uh, uh, gets more influence. I, I would like to give a last example that has nothing to do with politics, but shows this. Um, the German, um, I recently spoke at the um, a, a, a meeting of military, Catholic military chaplains from all of Europe. And the military bishops invited me to speak on religion and violence. And then uh, afterwards he said, oh, we have a chance here, we have an outsider I would like to discuss uh, how is it possible that the Catholic bishops' conferences all come from the same church? And when it comes to refugees, religious freedom, they are so diverse. The reality is the German bishops' conference calls for letting every refugee in. I mean, they are clearly even beyond the Social Democratic Party as the left-wing party. They really say it's a Christian duty Everybody that is needs needs to find a home here. And we did not do this. We did not find a home in, this, in, in the Third Reich when our people did flee. Yeah, and we need to provide this now. Um, I visit the um, presiding bishop of the Swiss church, of the Catholic church, of the Austrian church. You will find the exact opposite. The Swiss uh, Catholic, the Catholic church um, by one vote decided not to back the vote against minarets. Don't misunderstand me. We are not talking about calling from the minaret. The pure fact that the building has a minaret. Yeah. So it was very close to the Catholic Church in Switzerland backing vote against minarets. Yeah. And which is strange because in Switzerland the Catholic Church in Protestant areas really is a minority itself. Yeah. And um, good luck, they, they had this vote, but it, it, it shows the, the Catholic Bishop Conference in Switzerland yeah, is extremely on the other side. Um, no non-Christian refugees should come to Switzerland. Austria is very similar, the Bishop's Conference there. And so the, the, the discussion, this, is, this reminded me that something very similar in the moment is happening with the Christian, the former Christian Democratic parties who suddenly over this topic uh, are split on the topic where I would say that never had anything to do with the identity of the Christian Democratic parties. Yeah? It's a topic outside of what the historic uh, uh, um, um, uh, DNA was, and they don't know what to do. And um, in, in Germany, we will see what happens. Um, but uh, you will agree with me, probably, we have not the slightest clue in the moment 
even within the Christian Democratic Union, which of the sides uh, will win in the end. Yeah, We all hope that Mrs. Merkel will come down a little bit, and probably she will. But um, uh, so Christian Democratic parties in Europe um, had this, this great history because other than in the US, this Christian element always was seen as a neutral outside, as an ethical compass, how you do politics. And you can see this with Mrs. Merkel or uh, Horst Seehofer, those guys, they still are different from left-wing politicians in the way how they deal with others. Mrs. Merkel in her 12 years as chancellor has never said something negative about another politician, believe it or not. Yeah? And this is seen as Christian identity. The dignity of the other politician is yeah, something to be very careful, something that was not the main thing that you would find in the US, that Christian politicians never would say something negative about others. It's a different history, I know, but this was seen as the Christian compass. Now suddenly for the first time there is this challenge that Christian Democratic Party suddenly is a party fighting for a Christian country, not in the sense of the values, but the sheer number of people keep non-Christians out. Um, and it's very difficult because everybody knows we have to we have to do it. I mean, we cannot uh, get, uh, um, we had a poll, my wife did a, a study worldwide in Muslim countries, I was involved with the study. 80% uh, of the Muslim young people worldwide would like no longer to live in a Muslim country. 80%. If they could freely choose, the absolute majority of young people in the Muslim world would leave the Muslim world and come to the West. Yeah. And of course, we, we cannot say, oh, hallelujah, come along. Yeah, um, there's still so much space. Um, everybody knows this, uh, but it's a very difficult uh, problem now how to solve this as Christians. Does the Christian moral say we are more open minded to refugees than others for charity reason? Yeah. Or has it to be more we need to protect our Christian identity? Um, the good side, to be frank, is Christian politicians never were so open to speak about their faith as in the moment. Mm -hmm. That has totally changed. Helmut Kohl was chancellor for 16 years. People knew that he would go to the Catholic Church each Sunday. They knew that uh, the Americans had problems uh, when he was visited Camp David because he needed a Catholic church to go to. Um, and uh, so they had to drive him quite some, some way to the next church. In China, it became a problem because he always went to church. Yeah? So he was a dedicated Catholic Christian, but he never spoke about it. Yeah? I mean, it was not, um, he, he was very cautious because at that time it was a historic term, Christian Democratic Union. It was a traditional name, no, but, but uh, it was just seen as a, that has totally changed. That has totally changed um, the, the self-awareness of uh, that we are fighting for Christian values and that the connection between mm -hmm. democracy and Christian values is not just uh, something that happened in history, but that our core values of Christianity built into democracy and the other way around. This awareness is growing. <clears throat> Um, but it makes the problem between the Christian Democratic parties larger than, say, three or four or five years ago. Yeah? And like the bishops' conferences, um, now you would not believe that, say, the party in Hungary and um, that Orban and Merkel actually belong to the same European People's Party in the European Parliament and actually work together very often in Brussels. Thank you. And, uh... I forgot to mention that our co-host uh, of our lunch is uh, the Hans Seidel Foundation, their Washington, D.C. office, headed by my friend, uh, Christian Forstner, uh, who was, in fact, paying for our lunch. So we're, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is why I constantly pointed to him when I said Christian social media. Yeah. So. It's a good time if you have a few words you want no, no, to say. No, 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 no. Just go on. Uh, but uh, fantastic opening remarks. So let's take a question from uh, Mark Levecki our Providence Managing Editor, and then um, after uh, uh, the response, a question for Faith McDonald, then we'll open it up to uh, everybody else, if that sounds good. Yeah, good. Thank you, thank you everybody for coming. Thanks for lunch, uh, and thanks for your talk. Uh, you've, you've more than capably set uh, plenty of ground for questions on 
immigration, which I'm glad you touched on, because I'm sure there's going to be questions. I want to ask a very general question about foreign policy, and just see if we can get that dimension tossed in as well. I like how you said that uh, Christianity serves as an ethical compass for how to do politics. Um, you talked about identifiers of that Christian compass, not speaking ill of political opponents, for example. What in Germany are the are the identifiers of a Christian compass when we think about foreign policy in a larger aperture? So when, when Germans think about a German role in the world, German responsibility in the world, uh, what practical difference do the Christian Democrats bring to that kind of a conversation? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, um, well, Number one, I also would say um, it, it is, um, um, uh, I, I have to say it's a difficult, bit difficult to say because when it comes to foreign policy, especially in Germany, we have a strange situation which is similar in other countries too. Um, in in uh, Germany, when we have a coalition, normally uh, when, when the CDU, Christian Democratic Union, gets the chancellor, then it is the partner to take the second choice. If they would be clever, they would take the Minister of Finances, yeah, because he controls everything, but they are not clever. <laughs> so they normally choose the Minister, the Minister of Foreign, or they would choose the Minister of Inner Affairs, but they don't like the police anyway and all this <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So they take the Foreign Minister. And so the whole time Mrs. Merkel was Chancellor, the other party had the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yeah? Um, what that practically meant when she was together with, with uh, Westerwelle, uh, uh, who was the Foreign Minister from the Liberal Party, he has um, an ambassador for human rights of the federal government. And when I visited him the first time, wanted to discuss about religious freedom, and uh, when uh, suddenly there was a phone call, everybody left, we were sitting there alone, and he said, well, that's good that we are alone. Can you explain me? I, I have no feeling how religious people think. Yeah? Um, why in the world should somebody in Iran be so stupid to be a Muslim? But if he is so stupid, why then should he be more stupid to change his religion and become a Christian? And even this I do not care. Why should he tell anybody and risk his life? Can you tell me? Um, I said to him, I see we have a long career <laughs> before us working on religious freedom. Yeah. So, um, and, and so the, the, uh, the, what actually happened is the whole religious freedom world felt on Joachim Singhammer who was the uh, vice president of the parliament from the Christian Social Union mm -hmm. and the um, majority leader, um, Volker Kauder. Um, so it actually was put there where, where it, in theory, does not belong to. And Mrs. Merkel herself uh, did a lot when visiting China, etc. She's always open to much more than the American president, by the way. Um, also Obama, Bush, and so um, when we ask her to <coughs> go against signing a law on religions in Kazakhstan, she personally will call the president and tell him some things she will do if he signs it. At least I know afterwards he did not sign it and, and, and things like this. But it was not done by the foreign minister of foreign affairs. So it's difficult uh, to speak about the Christian foreign policy. Um, one result is then whenever that was involved, Actually, Mrs. Merkel herself became the foreign minister. Yeah, this is, for example, true in the relation to other European countries. Yeah, in the European Union and so on. Um, but I would say, number one, it is seen as a as a moral compass, something probably difficult to understand for the United States of America, um, that never lost, that never started and lost two world wars, like we did. Uh, one thing would be seen is that you never. Um, you always speak to others on an equal level. You never let them feel that economically, by your army, or however, you are the big guy and they have to follow and have to obey. The advantage is that this gives Germany a major role in many negotiations. Yeah. So uh, between North Sudan, South Sudan, there are many places um, where the Germans are seen as not not being involved because they 
want to get something for themselves. Yeah. The disadvantage, of course, is that to a certain extent this is a fancy dream. Yeah. Um, and when, when Donald Trump said in the UN, America first, but I think that's, that is the duty of any leader of a state to put his country first, as you always put your family first. I think that um, the majority of Germans would agree, but they never would say it in public. Yeah? Uh, in public, the, the political correctness says that we never use our strengths to, to put out, to, to get somebody to do something he otherwise do, does not want to do, but we have to convince him. But this is a kind of, of, of Christ, Christian compass in how we deal with others that, of course, is closely connected to um, to our experience through two world wars. Uh, with the army, it's a very difficult thing um, because um, uh, for a long time, our army was not really independent. Um, in theory, we always had to ask the four allied powers. In reality, that meant the Americans. And we still have the situation, as you probably know, that we have atomic bombs, uh, records, etc., based in Germany. And Germany is proud to say we have no atomic bombs. What nobody tells you is that our Air Force constantly is practicing to throw down those bombs. Yeah, because in case something happens, uh, of course, the Americans immediately will give the bombs to us. Yeah, but people are still still very proud that we are not 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 an atom a power wizard. Yeah, and. Um, um, it, it's, it's a strange mix because one half of Germany still would like to go back to those times where we not, were not responsible for some, anything. And when the first Iraq war was, Germans said, it's impossible that German soldiers go anywhere. Yeah? So m m Mr. Kohl did what Germans do, opened his pocket and gave the Americans 20 billion Euros, yeah, oh, Deutschmarks at that time, yeah. Um, so he paid, but otherwise, um, and nobody really objected, yeah. This is how we liked it. And the large part of the population still dreams of getting this back. The other half knows that since we are fully independent since the reunification, as one of the strongest economies in the world, uh, and with, with all the influence we have, it is our duty not to shy away when military operations assure human rights like the pirates in Somalia, etc., etc. And this goes very much back to the Christian identity. If you ask the um, more liberal churches, you will hear the one story which really goes into pacifism. Yeah, and means keep out of everything. And, and they, for example, are very clear uh, Germany has some of the best weapons in the world, and of course we earn a lot of money with them, and they would just close everything down. Yeah, The only weapons they would allow is water pistols or something like this, uh, but they, they would really, yeah. Um, while the other side, um, uh, the, the other side, which is not, um, well, the other side just says, we have to get, get back to normal. Um, and you can see this with when Donald Trump said, wait a minute, the NATO say 2% is for, for the military. Yeah. And Mrs. Merkel immediately said, of course. And it's not her fault, but this is not the fault of, of Bavaria or the Christian Social Union, but of the coalition partner who doesn't like it. Um, and so one half says, yeah, of course. I mean, not only because we promised it, but we need a functioning army to be involved worldwide, while the other part really would like to just cut the uh, budget to, to zero, yeah? By the best also for the police and for everything, the, the Secret Service, yeah? When we had 9-11, um, you know that the, um, the, 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 the terrorists mainly had studied in Hamburg. In Hamburg was all the information about them, but in the archive, yeah? Why? Because the, the intelligence service of Hamburg, which is a state in Germany, had only seven people working for it, and they all were working in the archive. They did not have any exec executive person working for this. That has changed meanwhile. But this shows it's not only a dream by some, but they would like to get rid of this. Yeah. Um, I have to say that it is more on the side of the Catholics as, as Christians to back 
um, a, a strong state that has a well-functioning police, a well-functioning army, is part of Christian identity because this is protecting human life. It is more on the side of the liberal Protestants uh, that go in, in, in the way to pacifism. Um, but you, you cannot easily put this to the parties. Um, um, and in, in, in the overall, the development clearly is to accepting a strong role of Germany in international affairs, normally only together with others. Yeah. Um, um, not not just on, on, on our own, but together with others. So when you poll with the young people, the new voters, you can see that they really, in a good sense, get away from history and are, are willing more, more to engage. Hmm. Thank you. And uh, Faith, a uh, question for you? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Schermacher. It's great to see you again, and thank you for your remark. And I'd just like to point out that this week was the, the 10,000, was it 316 days that since the Berlin Wall came down and, and it was up for that long. So just to say, yay yep. God and yay for freedom. Um, my question has to do with um, what you were talking about uh, in terms of the difficulty with both Christianity and democracy, really, in maintaining religious freedom because as Christians, we want to be tolerant and allow freedom for everyone, and democracy wants to be tolerant and allow freedom for everyone, and there are forces that take advantage of that. So um, I think that that would also be a problem with your split between the different views of Christians. And I'm wondering, um, first of all, how that would, how dangerous that makes it for maintaining and protecting religious freedom when we know that, for instance, Islam, even though they're Sunni and Shia and, and different factions, they do have a one goal, whereas Christians seem to be very divided on what goals should be. So how dangerous is that? And if I can cheat and just ask really quickly, too, um, uh, we're trying to revitalize the movement of um, protecting Christians in other countries who are being persecuted. This is the 20th anniversary of the International Religious Freedom Act in Congress. Um, and we want, you talked about DNA. We're trying to get that into the DNA of local churches to care about their persecuted brothers and sisters. And I was wondering, in Germany, is that part of the, the reality of people when they go to church to think about people who are persecuted for their faith around the world? Yeah. Um, let, let me start with, with the last thing you said. Um, a typical example is this book. This is our yearbook. It's in German, of course. Um, Persecution and Discrimination of Ye Christians, 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is mainly written for our parliament, and every parliamentarian gets it. Uh, in the parliament, the office controls what is thrown away, uh, because if you give a book to the parliamentarians and 90% throw it away, then you are not allowed <laughs> to give a book again. <laughs> and so we know that out of the 670 copies we gave to the parliament, three were thrown away. Yeah, I don't know how many were thrown away at home, but at least, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and you can see when the discussion comes on this topic, people know this book. So, um, so one uh, one member of parliament from the Communist Party, Die Linke, the left uh, is the name, criticized the Christian Democratic Union why they would talk about the persecution of Christians all the time and whether it would not be time to speak about other religions. I gave examples. Baha'i. Now, I was sitting on the tribune because the book was discussed and beside me were the leaders of the religious minorities in Germany, the Baha'is, the Alevites. They were sitting there beside me. Yeah? And the Baha'i already said, well, this is page 137 of your book. Yeah? And Volker Kauder, the majority leader, called in the room the book, turn the book, turn the book. <laughs> so he turned the book, and you find this yearbook on religious freedom, which is a documentation on all other religions. Mm -hmm. yeah? so, and that is the experience. The people that are working against persecution of Christians work for the religious freedom of all. Most people who criticize the Christians for it don't work for the religious freedom of anybody. They only bring the topic up 
when the, yeah, so. And our atheist uh, leader, Christian Lindner, when he still was in parliament from the Free, Free Democratic Party, even said to parliament once over this debate, uh, if you forbid to the left wing, if you forbid the Christians to speak up for Christians, who you think will stand up for Christians? Do you think the Muslims will stand up for Christians in the Middle East? So um, I think it's possible to very strongly have both sides. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Merkel made this herself very clear when we had the international parliament, uh, platform of parliamentarians on freedom of religion and, and belief in the German parliament. It was in Washington once, but it was, over, it was in Berlin. And she, of course, gave the major speak in the, in the parliament on it. And she made this amply clear that as the Chancellor of Germany in the European Union, uh, religious freedom is nothing you can discuss and sell. It's there. But then she said, but you cannot forbid me that beside this, as a private person and a Christian, I'm especially concerned about the face of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah? As long as I do my job, which I have to do for the rest, why in the world should I not speak up, especially against the persecution of Christians? And she made it amply clear, and we had Muslims, Buddhists, members of parliament from all over the world sitting there, not only Christians. Yeah? And she made it clear it's possible to have both, to be in favor of your family first, and to be in favor of all other families uh, uh, as well. Yeah? And I think this is very important that we transport um, I belong, I'm, I'm also Associate General Secretary of the World Evangelical Alliance, which in 1846 was the world first religious body to spell out religious freedom yeah, internationally. And they visited the Sultan and the, the Tsar in Russland and already at that time. Um, at that time, they were rather lonely because the state churches in Europe uh, saw this at their end, at their end, rightly so. Yeah, you, if this would be coming, there would be no state churches any longer. Gladly enough, this has happened after a long time. Um, but uh, so there is this, this historic tradition. Um, um, and we have to, and meanwhile, gradually, one church after the other took this over. Um, I always say evangelicalism. Evangelical means the search for the DNA of Christianity. This is think of what evangelicalism is. And this is part of the DNA. The problem is the moment all other churches take it over, the Catholic Church by the latest in 1963 in the Second Vatican Council, is it then evangelical or is it Christian? Yeah. Well, if we agree that it was a search for the DNA of Christianity, it doesn't matter if they all take it over, because it, and I believe, deeply believe it's not a political principle, it is not a good thing, it is not just a human rights discussion, it's also a human rights discussion, but it's the DNA, what we mean when we say faith. When we mean faith, we mean a personal trust into, in God. And not something you can force, not, not, nothing you have to do, nothing you prove by paying to somebody or, or else. Yeah? And uh, this includes, I don't know why, now I'm speaking as a Christian, I do not know why God has decided not to punish all the people that mock at him. I probably would have done it differently. <laughs> yeah? But it's very clear that the state has no, no task to punish people because they have the wrong religion. And the church has no task or no right to punish anybody for criticizing it. Yeah? So this is part of our DNA that even if we think people, think people are wrong, we fight for their freedom to be wrong, so to speak. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think that is what, what uh, is especially important for the evangelical world, which is rightly very strict on, on, on that uh, fundamentals of the Christian faith are not something you change every second week and which you put, do not put to a vote to make it amply clear that it includes the right to be wrong and to be tr protected because you and you and you alone decide on the most inner values you decide to live on. Yeah? And um, uh, so, um, and, and my experience is in Germany that this goes very well together.
Yeah. Now to the to to the Islam. I could go on for hours, but you better would invite my wife, um, because this is her uh, everyday life, um, and she has to discuss all those things. Um, uh, also with grand muftis. Uh, well, I'm often involved. I just spoke in Baku on the invitation of the president to 35 grand muftis and 15 ministers of religion of Muslim countries. Mm. Yeah, on religious freedom, on my Christian faith, so I'm involved there too, but my wife knows this much, much, much better. I think that, um, that Christians in general have to clearly make, um, show there is no one road dealing with Islam. Yeah? Um, but there are always two sides. On the one side, we have to back any positive development there is there. The queens in the Muslim world, the wives of the kings, all are very much working for the equality of women. Yeah? And we have to back them. And they have great successes. Yeah? Um, one of the biggest problems in the Muslim world, which many people rarely see, is, um, or probably 90% of the problem, is the development in the countryside that still the vast majority of young people go to Quran schools or no schooling, or at least schools where you just learn to obey. It's a very small group of people living in the cities that, that has a normal education, and most of them who really want to get a good education go to the West anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, no prince of Arabia ever got his good education uh, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, they all go as well. There's an exception in Lebanon, you can get a real good uh, education at the American University, yeah? um, which is the only real good university there. And uh, this, this, uh, this, this is a problem we, we have to start to solve, not only criticize, but we have to work with them. The King of uh, Jordan, which was at the last National Prayer Breakfast, and we, we, we talked about this, he installed a man to make a plan how to overcome this problem. He made a very good plan. Two days later, he was dead in Jordan. I mean, Jordan is not, not the place we are reminded, first of all, of, of, of terrorism. Two days later, because the Islamists knew that this would be the end. Yeah, if, if the young people on the, in the countryside. So we have to do all of this. But at the same time, um, uh, we have to have a very, 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 very strong hands on anybody who, for religious or other reasons, is willing to kill other people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What we often have is that, um, that in, 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 in Europe, in politics, that people on the one side are very nice to the Islamists, on the other side, are not really friendly to the good guys, but do as if somehow they are connected. Um, if you look into the details, uh, in Germany we have half a million Ahmadiyas. Most of them have come with the help of the evangelical lines from Pakistan because they are killed there. Yeah? I spoke to their 30,000 people meeting last year, and when I came in, they welcomed me with the German flag and the German national anthem. That is integration. Yeah, I mean they're fully integrated. They have jobs. They they start companies. They employ people. Yeah, they are Muslims. Yeah, but they don't have the Sharia. Yeah, um, and they come without it to Germany. Um, we have the uh, the uh, Alevites from Turkey. I already mentioned them. They are probably up to one million. They run under, under, if we put them in the big box of the bad Muslims, we lose allies. And, and uh, he, 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 he can confirm this. All top politicians in Germany from Turkish descent, where often they said, oh, we have Muslims as a member, as a president of parliament in Baden-Württemberg. They are all Alevites. Yeah? And the Alevites 300 years ago had no Sharia. The Alevites 300 years ago had equality between men and women. Yeah? So we, we really have to distinguish, take group by group. And uh, this, this, uh, the second thing is we have to assure that Muslim groups become independent. My wife has done a large study for our government on, on the communities. All the communities that take a bad development still depend on the hardcore Muslim countries. They do get their 
I don't say their commands, their ideology from there. Yeah? Um, and uh, the best example is Turkey. Um, the Turkish government pays 95% of all imams in Germany in Turkish mosques. So they are paid, and they, they even on Friday, they read what is written in Turkey, and they read it to the people. Very strange situation, very difficult to handle, uh, especially for, for many decades, Germany and the states liked them the most because the Turks were so secular. Yeah? Now Turkey has taken a totally different role, and suddenly we have 95% of our imams on Friday read Islamic nonsense, Islamist nonsense that comes from Turkey. Very complicated. Yeah? The interesting thing is Turkey exchanges the imams after 24 months. Why? Because even those imams, by learning German, by getting to know Germany, start to love Germany, love the freedom. They start to think positive, and so Turkey exchanges them. Yeah? So if they would stay there, if, yeah, if they would live there, probably there would be a positive development, because, but because they depend on Turkey, there is no progress. Yeah? Um, now, there it is very ob 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 obvious. In many other cases, it is much harder to see, but l large parts of our Arab communities totally depend via the inner internet on people like uh, Karadavi, who mm. is in Qatar, and when he goes on YouTube, um, he has easily 200 million clicks. Yeah? So every, uh, everybody in Hollywood, uh, every singer also would be glad uh, to, to have this. Yeah? And it is them that tell the very old stories, which, which uh, probably would have no chance in Germany, but are. Uh, yeah, so the new government is discussing, I fear there's no chance with the Social Democrats, what Germany can do at least to keep those Islamist priesters out of the country by not granting them a visa. Yeah, and probably like in Austria, we have to make a special law for it. Um, and of course, you cannot make an imam law. You have to make a law that fits to all religions, even so it's never used for any other religion. Um, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, but I think we need these two sides. Yeah, on the one side, if we mean religious freedom, it is for everybody, including Muslims. But we have to make clear religious freedom also means somebody that comes to destroy religious freedom. Yeah, has to be fought by the government. This is the task. The government has to assure relig uh, human rights, and if somebody, as his program, has to destroy human rights. The government is the only ones that can go against it. Yeah, I don't uh, believe, uh, ma many others of course too, I do not believe in waiting for an internal development um, because that has much to do with where comes the influence from the inside or the outside. We have young professors of Muslim theology at universities in, in Bonn. They become liberal and you know this, the moment they become liberal the Muslim communities stand up and say they have to lose, they have to leave. We will not accept them. Yeah, they are no longer Muslims. Yeah. So of course there is this development, but what does it help if the community does not change? Yeah. Um, Islam mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't wait for a, a, a Muslim, how to say, enlightenment movement. Mm -hmm. Islam had this in history several several times, and 100 years ago Islam was much nicer than today. It is, it is not that they are in the middle of a good development, but far behind us. Yeah, but 100 years ago, um, uh, I mean, in colonial times, Muslim col colonies were not seen as more difficult than other colonies. Yeah, think a moment you would have Muslim colonies today. Any of the countries, France, England, would have colonies in, in, in the Muslim world. It probably would take 95% of all the funds uh, to, to, to control them. Yeah. Um, I tell my students, Arafat, yeah, in the 60s and the 70s, he was a Muslim, but nobody knew it. It didn't have anything to do with this. He was a very secular guy. Uh, he was an ally of the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, so, and the de development went in the other direction. He became more and more religious and ended up as an Islamist. Yeah, 
Um, and there are many similar developments. Egypt has been very secular at times, yeah? mm -hmm. and now it's, it's a nightmare. Turkey, not to talk about. It, they wanted to get rid, rid of Islam altogether. They did more or less forbid Islam in the country. Yeah? And um, the development is not getting better. It is just the opposite. And uh, now we have a, have a president. Uh, yeah, of course, have to say Erdogan grew up as an Islamist. He killed people in his 20s. Be, um, and then he went to prison for that. And when he came out, he said, I'm much better now. I'm a nice guy now. If people would have watched, they would have seen that he always hated the Christian minority. And that should have been evidence enough that he always was an Islamist. Yeah, But he made people believe that he is now the nice guy and he's back to normal now, what he always wanted to do. But he took the whole country with him, a country that became secular, similar like our countries, more secular, more secular. And we have the reverse story now. Yeah, so to wait for the moment when Turkey becomes secular, um, I, I think we have we have to deal mm. with this like we would deal with everybody else. Yeah, if somebody tells me I want to kill you, I inform the government, and I do not care what belief or what party he belongs to. I want the government to get involved and stop him from saying this, and of course for putting this into practice. Yeah. So um, uh, we really need both sides. Yeah? And I personally think that, can, that Germany is on the best way to it. It could be done much better. Coalition governments are always a problem, no question. Yeah? But in principle, if I take Bavaria, it's a good example. On the one side, they have best relations to the Muslim community. On the other side, the Secret Service and, and so on, very much after that. If you are not willing to do both at the same time, you will lose. We have time for about 10 minutes of uh, questions. Uh, Jerome? Sure. Uh, my name is Jerome Sokolowski. I'm an editor of a uh, religion news service. We cover religion, all kinds of religions in the US and around the world. Um, one of our, our European correspondents recently wrote a story about uh, Germans being, many Germans being upset at um, slogans that immigrants or people of Middle Eastern origin were uh, shouting during protests. Uh, which were death to the Jews and things like that, and that there was a response, I think, by the Christian Democrats to require some kind of education around anti-Semitism of immigrants, taking them to Auschwitz, even expelling people who promote hatred of Jews. And I'm wondering where, where do you stand on, on what's your view on, on that? Well, which again, just to remind you, is very closely connected to the matter of religious freedom. Yeah. You have to say that uh, the Muslim, that the, the percentage of anti-Semitism among the Muslim community in Germany was higher than among the rest that was known. But you rarely would find evidence in public. Yeah. Uh, the Muslim community, uh, the official uh, Muslim community, let me say it this way, was too clever knowing that if you start with anti-Semitism, you lose the, the backing of any Germans, no matter what part, what party. Then, I mean, that, that really is something that goes from right to left. And um, this change with the one, one million coming, yeah? Um, and they also have a different attitude. You have to say, I'm, this is not to speaking bad about Muslims. We had one million, and you know there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, so the one million does not represent the 250 million Muslims in Indonesia, which are probably the most friendly people in the world. Yeah? But with those people, we have a large group coming, knowing they have no chance to get asylum. They either go to Berlin, where we have a left, very left-wing uh, state government, which does not send anybody back. So if you make it to Berlin, you know you can stay at least as long as this government is not changed and, and the CDU comes back to, uh, to, to, to power. Um, but we also have, especially from, from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, many young people who know they have no chance. The best chance they had that for years, those three countries would not take anybody back. They didn't want those guys. 
but Mrs. Merkel recently negotiated, finalized the negotiation with the three countries. So now they take the people back. And we have many that come knowing they will stay one year in Germany and try to take as much as they can during this year. May it be robbing people, stealing people, whatever. Yeah, they will go back. And when they go back, nobody cares what they did during this time. Yeah. Um, so we have a totally new group of people among this. You have heard of this famous case in Cologne where several thousands of those young people uh, came for the, the New Year's night mm -hmm. and grabbed women, uh, even in two cases, uh, raped them and, and on purpose met there. The, the community we had so far never would have done this, knowing that this is a nightmare for the credibility of Islam. Yeah? Uh, they did it anyway, and they now go into public with, for example, when Jerusalem, when Trump spoke about Jerusalem becoming the capital, um, all over Berlin they would burn uh, Israeli, Israeli flags. Now we have no law against it, yeah, um, but people were extremely upset, yeah, of all parties, of all age, yeah. So now there is the discussion: Do we need? a law that specifically forbids to burn the Israeli flag. Yeah? I don't know whether this is a solution, because you could have done something anyway. The police, for example, could just have forbidden the demonstrations. But we are in Berlin, and this is the task of the state, not of the federal government. And in Berlin, they don't forbid anything. So the police were standing there watching. Um, that would not have happened in Bavaria. Uh, in Bavaria, there is no picture of one uh, Israeli flag burning, which is not because they did not try to burn it, yeah? but the moment you try to do it, the police is there and stops you. Yeah? But in Berlin, that is possible, and it's the capital, so it goes to the media. This is a nightmare to Germany, I can tell you. It's a nightmare to everybody. That has nothing to do with where you belong to, yeah? uh, because um, anti-Semitism, I mean, that's, that's, uh, we never want this again, yeah, and suddenly we have it openly on the street, we have really signs that they, that, that uh, speak about killing, yeah, people that you may arrest, but all you can do is send them back to their home countries, but uh, it doesn't make any sense that put them to a regular court, uh, court case. Um, and the, the uh, traditional conservative Muslim community, the organizations, um, they are very weak in going against this. They, of course, say, well, this is not the way how we do it. Uh, vague things like this where you say, okay, what is your way of anti-Semitism then if you don't uh, do this? Yeah. And for the first time in history, we have the situations that, for example, rabbis, don't dress as rabbis when they go to the streets. They still dress in Bavaria uh, or in, 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 in certain places, but in the states that have left-wing governments, the rabbis don't go on the street, and that's a nightmare. That's a real nightmare. Um, so there is this idea uh, to bring all asylum seekers to Auschwitz, make a law that if you want to get asylum, you lawyers say, whether that is possible, yeah, I mean, whether the, the Supreme Court will not just kill this immediately. Um, nobody has a real answer how to, how to deal with this, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's in, incredible. And, of course, the Jews expect Germany to do something about this, yeah. I think it will become worse, and it will come to a, a violent showdown in the sense that it will become more violent, and whether people like it or not, the state has to intervene with real, well, then let force to stop it. Yeah. But it has really the potential to, to, to change the, the mood in Germany. It's, it's. Um, uh, by the way, if I would have a marketing company, um, I would tell my Muslim friends. You could not do nothing worse for marketing Islam in Germany than this. Yeah? Because it's the first time that even the left-wing community does not back Muslims. 
normally the left-wing community is always in favor of them, whatever they do. And it's the first time where, because that's the left-wing DNA, they are proud that under Hitler, the communist parties, the left-wing parties went to Kazet uh, and, and were persecuted. So for them, that's part of art. And for the first time, they have to decide. Um, and they normally choose that being against anti-Semitism is more important than to be pro-Islam. Yeah, so in the long run, it will be it, it it does not pay for Islam. Yeah, so I would I would uh, advise the official Muslim community much to go against it much more directly. If you think that at time in Paris when they killed there, there was there, this was the peak of solidarity between the official Muslim institutions and the government. They would show up in public under the Bannenburg law. That no longer would happen because you do not know whether one of those guys tomorrow says kill the Jews. Yeah, Nobody wants to to be on a photo. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do not know. You do not know. I respected Muslim leaders suddenly say things. Uh, I mean, around Jerusalem, you can have different opinions. Yeah. But what was said around the question whether Jerusalem is the capital, which is strange, as you know, because it's the capital anyway. It's not the capital because uh, the U.S. moves the, the embassy there, yeah? but because a sovereign state has... We have decided Berlin is the um, uh, capital, and Mrs. Thatcher was against that. She didn't want Berlin as the capital. Who cares? I mean, it's our parliament that decides where the capital is. Yeah. Um, so... Um, and nevertheless, things that were said by respected Muslim leaders in, in this time, I'm not saying criticizing that Trump should not have done it or so. Yeah? But what they said about the existence of Israel, that, that was uh, some of those guys I know, I was shocked. I had no idea that they think like this. Yeah? And, um, yeah, I just sorry. have to follow up on that because I thought you were saying that things had changed because of the immigration, but you're saying respected Muslim leaders in Germany, not just recent immigrants, were saying some anti-Semitic things, right? Yeah, but, but um, uh, uh, the, 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 situa the, the situation changed through the, the kind of refugees. The million people we got, you see, the, the left-wing media told us those million people, I exaggerate a bit, 900% of them are babies that are dying if they do not come. Mm -hmm. yeah? right. They gave the impression these are real people leaving the wars and they have no other place to go. In reality, the vast majority are, are young yeah. men yeah. without their families yeah. that have no place. Mm -hmm. And in the Muslim world, you have millions of them. Yeah? And they just try to find a place where they can go. Yeah? And um, so the fabric of this one million Muslims or those the, the, is totally different to the five million Muslims we have already. Yeah? As Cologne was the best example. Yeah? And, um, and uh, um, now the question is, how does the official community react, the Muslim community react? And they are torn forth and back on the one side being against it and thinking that is bad marketing. And on the other side, that those guys spell out some things that everybody thinks, but nobody will say in public. Yeah? So they are really weak in reacting to this. Yeah? Their only chance really would be, be to speak up against this mm -hmm. even stronger than the Central Council of Jews in Germany. Yeah? And um, they would have to, if they, for example, would say, this is a statement on this topic against anti-Semitism that will be read next Friday in every mosque. Mm -hmm. That would be convincing. Yeah? The reality is uh, that now the journalists, of course, start to research and find out that a lot of things the young people say mm -hmm. are regularly said in the mosques, mm -hmm. in Turkish and in Arabic, so nobody, uh, no German knows it. Yeah? And um, so they, they are in a bad situation now. Yeah, and uh, instead of, uh, and of course you have to add, ninety-five percent of the imams, ninety ninety-five percent, are paid by Turkey, and of course Turkey will not let them speak up against, uh, in, step up in favor of Israel. Yeah. yeah, they have no 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 interest, the wrong position. I mean, they they want to defend the Turkish position. Yeah.
but I have to say, three years ago, nobody saw this coming. Before this, and and nobody, when the discussion was, how many people do we let in? What do we do with the refugees in Hungary, uh, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, nobody had any idea um, what kind of people would come, and that this really would change the the um, the, the whole mood. Yeah, because again. We have anti-Semites like you have them in every country, and uh, but but in the public, on the street, mm -hmm. uh, to read that uh, uh, um, throw Israel into the water or, or stuff like this, this never has happened before. Yeah. We have time for one more question, John. You had your okay, sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm John Bottomore, and I work in the defense and security industry. Um, I, yeah, I think, or I would submit that kind of underpinning all of this is a decline in the traditional faith of, of Christianity in <clears throat> Germany and the rest of Europe. And the same thing is, is happening here. And I, and I think, you know, some of the trend of what, hap of what happened is partly maybe uh, naivete or positive thinking, whatever, but I, I, I don't think it's too surprising, frankly, of what, what we've seen happen. And I think it's important that Americans watch this very carefully too because the same kind of thing can happen here and as the old saying goes when you stand for nothing you will fall for anything and so my question quite simply is what would trigger a christian revival in germany and in europe that might offset this with the kind of thinking it, it's you know it's not going to cause all muslims to be pushed out of europe but the kind of the kind of the kind of love and the kind of strength that that kind of traditional faith would bring in the populace and in the leaders that might counteract this trend that we're seeing. If you want a short answer, you are asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> because you are now in the middle of we can all have dinner sometime. Of in the middle of my life. Um, um, my wife recently lectured, the, the mayor of Cologne invited her to speak to all uh, her, the, the, the people involved, social workers, police officers, etc., some are on, on, on Islam in Europe. And the journalist, a very secular man, next day had a heading, two pages, large article, and a huge heading, something my wife had never said verbatim. Not Islam, but the condition of our churches is a threat to Europe. Being in a secular realm, mayor of Cologne, having Muslims sitting there, my wife did not say this. Nevertheless, this, this journalist actually understood what she was saying. And I'm deeply convinced we have no problem with Islam, we have a problem with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Merkel has said this in a rather not thought through way, very spontaneously, recently in Switzerland, when she got an honorary doctorate, and then uh, students uh, were allowed to ask her questions. It was live in TV. And one student asked us, is it not your task to protect us against the Muslims and not to make, uh, I don't know, not to make friends with them? Now, it was a little bit funny that a Swiss citizen asked the German uh, <laughs> chancellor, <laughs> yeah, okay, well, forget about this. In short, Mrs. Merkel answer, and, and, and it's a nightmare that so many people will read the, the Quran. And Mrs. Merkel's answer was, um, I'm not concerned about the many people reading the Quran, but I'm concerned about the many people not reading the Bible. Now, to be frank, Christian Social Union, so I have to be a little bit critical now. It's a bit naive. That's only part of the story. If this is all, yeah, you cannot cope with, with uh, it's also a very political question. Yeah? And the state cannot be concerned about Bible, Koran or so. He is uh, interested in violence or not, in uh, human rights violation or not. But in principle, it shows where her heart is and she, that she is totally right. And one of the reasons why she is not so strong in persecution of Muslim violations. Mm -hmm. yeah, Because she really believes that only the revival of, of Christianity. And of course, when I speak about the differences between Bavaria, 
and the other parts, you will not be astonished that, of course, the church is much better uh, state, state in Bavaria than, say, in uh, the, the new states, the, the former uh, GDR, where two to three people, uh, two to three percent of the people still go to church. In West Germany, still 85 percent of all the people belong to a church. Yeah? In the new, it's two to three percent. It's really down. And of course, um, um, and the problem we have, which I started out with, Christian Democratic Unions, is those parties like in Poland, like in, in, in Hungary, or also those winning in, in, in the former GDR, in the, what we call the new states that, uh, that were added after the reunification, is they fight for Christianity without practicing it. They actually do not know what they are speaking about. The best example, normally I would show you the picture if, if we had the chance here, is um, one of the groups that once defend Christian Germany. They run around with a huge cross, Jesus on it, and it has the German colors on it. Yeah, I know that the Americans go very far by putting a flag into the altar room. <laughs> that would be too much for Germans. Yeah, uh, um, uh, so keep it not not okay. But nevertheless, to take the cross of Jesus as the symbol of Christianity and put the colors of Germany on top of it, that is a sacrilege for good Christians, for practicing Christians. They never would do it. Yeah? And they do it and because they do not know that you don't do it. Yeah? They defend Christianity they no longer practice. And I think that is, that is the problem that we get, um, that if I take Hungary, it is not a religious country. The party that is in power gets the votes as being a Christian party, 71% or something mm -hmm. like this. Amazing. And if you visit the country, you see the practice of, of, of Christian faith is not. And of course, those people then are also not very fond to be nice to Jews or Muslims or others because it's not their. Yeah. Um, the strange thing is when you say we need a revival. We switch now from politics, of course. Yes, I'm deeply convinced that um, the, the only chance Europe has is that the, the personal faith of many people is revived. Not the churches, yeah, but this. Pope Benedict said it when he visited Germany. Pope Francis had said it again and again. Uh, this is a very old evangelical message, which meanwhile comes from more or less everybody in the churches, that this is the only chance. Yeah? The strange thing is that for the first time ever, we have this development in Germany in the moment, thanks to the refugees. Why? Number one, we have about probably out of the 1 million, already 10,000 of the Muslims have been baptized. Yeah. Now, this in itself would not help Germany. It would help the refugees. Yeah. But they have to be baptized somewhere. Now, some evangelical groups are in contact with them and baptize them. Of course, we have churches that have a pastor that is a former Muslim, now a Christian uh, from Iran, for example, and of course they very uh, actively, you might, we might even say aggressively, uh, target the people of their own language and their own culture. But the, ma the vast majority of those people coming to Germany wanting to become Christians go to the, to the next bell tower, which is either a Catholic bell tower of the Protestant state church. And they are not prepared for adult baptism. For centuries, they have practiced children baptism. Yeah? They often do not know, I have priests calling me, what do I do? I don't know what liturgy to use. And I have to tell them, get out your liturgy book on page 722, there is the <laughs> liturgy. How are you? Yeah? And, um, and it, the, the, the churches try to cover it. Yeah, the Archbishop of Vienna um, just uh, wrote me uh, a week ago that in Vienna alone, in, in his diocese, they had 715 baptism of former Muslims mm -hmm. the last year. This is not Austria, this is only Vienna. Yeah, Officially it does not exist. The Catholic Church in Austria is very proud that they do dialogue and not mission. Um, and yet this is yeah. upcoming and they start to evangelize. 
So if I think of my own church, a reformed church, but it's together with the Lutheran church in, in Bonn, in the center, the historic Lutheran church. Um, and they every Sunday they baptize former Muslims. And as good Germans tell them, in Germany, you normally don't say something after you have been baptized. You sit down and you are quiet. And the people from Afghanistan, from Iran, from Iraq, wherever they come, they, uh, they don't care. Yeah? They stand there and tell the story um, uh, why they become Christians. Recently, a journalist of the Welt asked me, we heard that we have people that become Christians here and they are not safe. Their life is in danger. We cannot believe it. Can you bring us into contact with some of them so that we can report their story? I said, well, they're very delicate. They have to decide. But I will ask them. And if they are open, and we will be present during the interview to assure that you don't turn this in the opposite. In the end, two large pages came with the three stories. Yeah? And an evangelical Billy Graham could not have written the page better. <laughs> Three stories without critical comments why they had become Christians. Yeah? And um, th so for the first time ever, we have this discussion starting in the mainline historic churches. Yeah? Why to be a Christian? And the, the, um, uh, the Archbishop of uh, uh, the Cardinal uh, Schönborn from, from Vienna, he said, the interest by his church member what Christianity is, is as high as never before. <laughs> yeah? Now the uh, synod of the Rhenish church where I live, they just decided that there should be dialogue. Christians are urged to witness to their faith, but they should absolutely refrain from any intention to convert the Muslims. This is how the leadership reacts. Yeah? The interesting thing is the protest does not come from evangelicals alone. It's automatic. It does not come from the institutions in the church that are responsible for mission that say, wait a minute, why didn't you ask us? Yeah? It really comes from Germany. Yeah? I wrote an, an answer to it and um, sent it to the German evangelical lines. So my own people said, ah, yeah, good, good, but I don't know whether we should publish it. And the only one that reacted was the EAK of the CDU and CSU that want to publish it uh, soon. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why should the po political party uh, publish uh, a theological statement on the question whether you may evangelize Muslims or not? Yeah. Uh, but you can see that, that this really goes far beyond now. And I think that, that in the moment, all over Europe, the interest what Christianity really is, is higher than any time before. Yeah? It could be that in the end, that what, what started as a nightmare, and where people say, if we wait 25 years, they will have the majority of the voters, and then the parliament will be, that the result is just the opposite. Yeah? That, uh, that the continent is, and, and to say this on a very practical level, uh, I grew up, I, I went to school, I, I finished my school in 78. So from 66 to 78, I went to school. That was the peak of what we call the 68 revolution. Yeah? The fact that I was a Christian, not that I was an evangelical, they never got so far. The pure fact that I was a practicing Christian was a nightmare in my class. I was in a very conservative, old gymnasium, 375 years old. It didn't make a difference. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, yeah. And the pure fact that no girl could get me into bed to be, be open, yeah. It was a very, very hot topic and they would pay money for, for them. And so this, this was, it, was the times, yeah. This has totally changed, yeah. To be a practicing Christian in Germany is a credible thing again. Yeah, You are hardly criticized for it. Um, to give you a very last example, I spoke about uh, at, at Gießen University, the Gießen is where I grew up, at Gießen University when I was 25 or so, I g gave a lecture um, um, on, on the question, uh, 
whether there's, uh, uh, um, can we have, may we have, should we have evidence that God exists? So it was not only can we have, but should we have? Because at that times, people would say it's a matter of experience. Yeah, and, and so on. So I gave this like, it was a nightmare, I can tell you. It was a nightmare. You hardly could speak on the topic. The pure fact that you would use the word God assured that somebody would intervene and people were highly critical, etc. So just for fun, 25 years later, I decided to give the same lecture at the same place in the same university. Yeah. The first question was, I have to apologize with my question because I do not practice any religion. So I really cannot talk about this topic, but I have a question. Yeah, that, that, that is the new situation, totally different situation that you are no longer the, the, the stupid guy. Yeah, but that people apologize that they do not practice uh, religion. And if I take our parties, the Social Democratic Party has totally given up to say anything against Christianity because that means they lose the last voters they have. Yeah. And I would say even the left wing, the former Communist Party, yeah, it's difficult. They will still say there should be no church tax. Okay, I personally would even be in agreement with them <laughs> on this. Yeah, so they have the, but they do not speak about up against Christianity and the church as such any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the typical example was that the two presiding bishops, uh, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, visited Jerusalem, and they went out of the Temple Mount and took their bishops' cross down. You know the story, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. um, Marx and Bedford Stroh, uh -huh. yeah. And so they, you could see the, the, they being bishops, but there was no cross. Yeah, there was an outrage. Even even our normal news uh, service criticized this. Not evangelicals, who normally don't care about whether you, yeah, not the churches. The general public was was totally upset. Yeah. Now the two said this was after counseling with the Jews. And so the chief rabbi uh, went to the media and said, we Jews never would ask any bishop to take up his cross. And why in the world should we ask him to take it up on the Temple Mount, where we have nothing to say anyway? Yeah, this really was for the Muslims, which then find out. And finally, it was self-secularization. That is, nobody had asked them to take it down. They had done it uh, to be nice to the Muslims before they even were asked. Yeah, But the interesting thing is, that that um, the, the, the normal people do not understand it. Why should a bishop take their cross down? Either he believes it or he doesn't. This is a totally new mode uh, that people think Christianity is about believing something, to be bold, staying for it. Yeah, you remember Rutgers, Jürgen Rutgers, who is in town, by the way. Yeah, um, um, this was the beginning in an election campaign for North Rhine-Westphalia. A journalist pressed him whether he thinks that his worldview is uh, better um, and, and more important and more right than others. And um, he didn't want to answer this question and the, the journalist kept pressing. So he finally said, OK, to um, just to get rid of this question now, I'm fed up. Yeah, I'm a Catholic. I believe that God created the world, blah, 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 blah. And of course, this is my religion because I think it has more truths than other, other worldviews and it is better for me. The media, huge outrage, now he has lost the election. That were the old times. Yeah, The reality is, did win the election. Not because, of the, because he said it, but because to the people, that was no reason any longer not to vote for him. Yeah, they accepted this, and this is the new mood that people say, well, of course, when you are a Christian, of course you take it for granted. Um, and this is why they do not understand a church saying you should never have the intention to convert a Muslim. I mean, you all know that's not the reality. When we talk to Muslims, yeah, there can be thousands of reasons. And when I go shopping and I have a Muslim selling me, I don't know, uh, some books, yeah, I'm not sitting there and think, oh, what can I do that, uh, yeah, I mean, we are human beings talking to each other, but when we talk about our faith, 
and we testify to what we believe. Of course, we are happy about everybody that is willing to agree to this faith and to believe in Jesus, of course. Yeah? And now to say from our side, to promise that we never will do it. Yeah? And what they do, asking the Muslims also not to do it. I mean, by the latest there, most people start to laugh as if Muslims will no longer be interested in converting us because a church synod has decided <laughs> that is not good. Period. Yeah, I mean, that, that shows a little bit how far this is. But this is, this is a changing mood. Yeah, we have top people in economy, in all areas, in, in science, which suddenly show, speak up publicly in the media as Christians, which we not, didn't have before. Yeah? So when you think of Deichmann, uh, 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 I, I could think of many very rich people. Yeah? Um, nobody was interested, two of them was, was Christian or not. And now you will find big stories, what, how they use their money in India and what they do, etc. It has become a credible thing again yeah? to be a practicing Christian. Um, and this has a lot to do with Islam and the refugee crisis and the question. And the interesting thing is when I speak with members of parliament, no matter where they belong to, they all agree um, that the, the, the future will depend on the questions whether we believe our values or not. Yeah. If we say they are relative, uh, it's, it, it, it's a nice option to do it this and this way. For example, religious freedom is a, is a nice option, be nice to others. Yeah? But uh, yeah, um, most of them really agree. And one member of parliament, not from a Christian party, he joked and told me, we'll give you 10 billion euros and you convert all Muslims. I said, uh, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why this? I mean, you are not a Christian yourself. Yeah. What, what would it help? Why do you want us to make them? He said, you know what? It doesn't help if we shift the Muslims from one group to the other or from a more liberal version to a more this version. They no longer should be Muslims. And you are the only ones that know how to do this. Yeah. A little wrong perception of, OK, but you understand. Yeah. So. <laughs> We pay you, you change it, and the problem is solved. So my last word was, you know what? If the evangelicals get 10 billion euros, they will become so corrupt that they will not do mission anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it shows a little bit that even he, as a as a secular person in Parliament, even so we were joking. Yeah. He had this ideas and, and, and said, this is the only way how we in the end can May I have a one sentence for the US. Why has the US been a Christian country for so long? Not because only Christians moved to the US. The US always had an influx from people, China, Vietnam, from countries where people traditionally were no Christians. But a vast majority of them were evangelized and became Christians. Yeah, And this has stopped. If this still would be the case, uh, the interesting thing is that Muslims, even if they know this, come anyway. Yeah, It would not lower the number. Yeah, How does this happen? I mean, look into the history. 200 years ago, somebody came with a ship. Yeah. And before he would know that this is America, there would be an evangelical uh, with the Irish people, a Catholic priest. Somebody would be there at the ship to be the first to greet them. And this is one of the reasons why we have so many refugees that become Christians. Yeah? Because already in Hungary and, and on the whole Balkan route, as we call it, you will find Christians all over the place providing food, providing shelter and giving Bibles. Why do they do it? Because it would be difficult to do it in Germany. I mean, not the food, not the shelter, but to hand the Bible over, the, the media immediately will go after you. So we do it outside. Yeah. And um, I think America, if you, if, you, if you study the history, you could, can see the moment. And this is not the government, as you know. It never was the task of the American president to evangelize 
people that come in. It's the task of the church. If the church stops to do it, it's only a matter of time uh, until something else takes over. The idea that you that you could could keep Europe to go back to Europe that you could keep Europe in the nowhere, yeah, that there is nothing, and now the Muslims come and we find a way that 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 that. that that never has happened in history. Yeah? If you study history, a secular time always has been a time of transition. Secularism never has outlived several generations. Yeah? It's always, that was true with the Roman times, the Greek times, all of history. When religion goes down, you can have a generation that more or less has none. Yeah? But a generation later, Religion is back. It's only the question, what kind of religion? What I think is true, I'm now not speaking as an evangelical. I hope you don't misunderstand me as this. The new form of Christianity that could be a help to Europe will no longer be the traditional kind of Christianity, but it will be an evangelical kind of Christianity. I do not say a Protestant, because many in the Catholic Church see it the same way. Yeah? And Pope Francis is the best example, going for a very personal phase that you, yeah, so I do not mean evangelical in the confessional sense, but in the sense that the center is not that you belong to a church, that the, but that you personally uh, know why you believe, what you believe, and com can, can communicate it to, to your neighbor. Yeah. And that was the history of the US, that in no country in the world, at times, you had more normal people on the street that were able to do that because there was no state church. Yeah? That's no longer is the case. Um, and this is what, what would need to be revived here too, but even more so in, in, in Europe where still the official religion more or less is the old uh, historic uh, uh, religion where you be, first of all belong to an institution. That no longer will sell, save. Yeah? Um, but I see a good chance um, that, that uh, practice, personal Christianity comes back. And that, of course, also, also will end up in existing institutions. I'm not against institutions. Yeah? But this, if this is all you have, you cannot go um, the, the Synod of the Rheinisch Church, um, which I've spoken about some years ago, had a synod on mission. And they were discussing up and down how to get more members. And a secular journalist, this is my last word to your, uh, to your question, a secular journalist wrote a commentary. Yeah? This church has forgotten the most basic rule of business. You cannot sell what you do not have. Yeah? Better than any Christian commentary. Yeah? <laughs> Criticizing this. Yeah? The most basic rule of business, you cannot sell what you do not have. Yeah? And so they ended up with, uh, with, with um, posters where gold medal winners would say, I became a member of the church, and things like this, thinking that then people will enter, become members of the church. The, the, the swimmer would not say why he became a member of the church. And he did not say, I became a Christian, but he became a member of the church and, and stuff like this. So you cannot sell what you do not have. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate so